Hi, in this video we're going to go over the histology of bone. Before we do, however, let's talk a little bit about some terminology just so that some of the, things, some of the things that I say aren't completely foreign to you. So what we're going to be doing for the most part is discussing the long bones. Okay, And so when we're discussing long bones, there are parts of the bone that we tend to talk about such as the epiphysis, which is this part right here, and uh, this part right here. So these are the ends of the bones. And the diaphysis, which is the shaft of the bone. Um, this will be uh, especially important when we discuss uh, bone development, um, because we'll be talking about a region that kind of divides uh, the diaphysis from the epiphysis, called the epiphyseal plate, uh, which will be found right around here for example within the bone and also it's kind of shown here in this cutaway within this kind of region called the epiphyseal line that is highlighted here for you okay so um, these are kind of important terms to be familiar with especially if we talk about bone development uh, the other terms I wanted to point out um, that will be important in our discussion of the histology are the periosteum and the endosteum. And so what I'm underlining here are the prefixes peri and endo. You have seen endo before. You've seen endo um, in the endothelium. And so endo means within, so on the inside of something. So on the inside. Okay, so endothelium was the lining of the inside of a blood vessel. The endosteum is going to be uh, re referring to a layer of osteoblasts, the bone secreting cells, on the inner surfaces of bone. And that's kind of a difficult concept initially to wrap your head around. Uh, but what we're talking about is the outside of a bone. So what I have here at the top in this image is kind of a, a cutaway of an actual bone. And so what you see is the outside of the bone, over here. And that's where we would find the periosteum. This is on the outside of a bone. So that's the periosteum. Now, as you can see, on the inside of the bone, what we have... Oops, what do I do? Is these very thin sort of lines and these correspond to bone tissue. I probably should just maybe use a different color here so it's more visible. So you have very thin lines within this region and those correspond to bone matrix and this is spongy bone that you're seeing here. Maybe I will use a thicker line. Okay, So these are spongy bone. These are called bone trabeculae. Okay. So what we're seeing inside here is spongy bone. Okay. And so obviously this is bone tissue and then there are cavities around the outside of that bone tissue. That's where the bone marrow would be. And so that means that there is going to be a, a layer of cells that will be on the surface. Maybe a thicker line here. Will be on the surface of these bone trabeculae. Okay, so this is what we mean about on the inside of the bone, but it's on the outside of the bone tissue. Okay, so we're going to have cells on the surface of bone tissue, but on the inside of a bone. Okay, that's the endosteum. So that's this stuff right here. And I will show this to you very shortly in an actual slide. Okay, so again, uh, we're in both cases we're looking at bone secreting cells, so there'll be osteoblasts in both cases. But in one case it's on the outside of a bone, a bone is a structure. Um, and in the other case, it's on the inside of a bone, 
but on the outer surface of bone matrix. Okay. The other term that I need to um, identify for you here is osteoid. Osteoid refers to the organic component of bone matrix. Okay, so this is the organic portion of the bone matrix, which is basically mostly type 1 collagen. Now, bone tissue, bone matrix is composed of the osteoid and the uh, inorganic component, which is called calcium phosphate crystals. Um, and so uh, they are kind of broken up into two um, overall uh, kind of components that are about 50-50. So when we look at the composition of bone, the extracellular matrix is 50% organic, and 50% inorganic. And so again, most of the organic components type 1 collagen. And the inorganic component is composed of calcium phosphate crystals. They're referred to as hydroxyapatite crystals. And the thing about these is that they, uh, the presence of these crystals within the matrix tends to exclude water. Okay, so that means that bone matrix is not hydrated. Okay, so matrix is not hydrated. So that right there is a major difference between cartilage and bone tissues. And the hydration of the matrix is a major, major component, and that will have an impact on uh, the organization of this tissue. Okay, Now, outside of the extracellular matrix, what we have are cells, and so, again, fibroblasts are listed in here, but they're listed in here because you will see some fibroblasts on some of the slides, but they're not really part of bone tissue, they're on the outside of the bone tissue, so we're not going to discuss these too much, um, but I will point them out to you as we go through. So the only cells that you really need to worry about when you are looking at tissues uh, that are bone tissues are cells called osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. And so based on the, su uh, the suffixes that you're seeing here, the blast and the site, you can hopefully figure out what these cells do. And again, they are very much analogous to what we saw in cartilage. The same overall idea is happening here as well. We have these more active cells, the osteoblasts, are secreting actively, secreting matrix on the outside of the bone tissue, and then once they become completely enveloped by that tissue, they are referred to as osteocytes. Now there's a new tissue, a cell type that is uh, introduced here in bone, is just the osteoclast, which is a phagocytic cell that helps with the reorganization of bone tissue. Okay, let's move on to the next slide and take a look at these in a bit more detail. So osteoblasts, um, as I just mentioned, are highly active cells. Uh, these are cells that actively produce bone matrix, and they're going to be found on the surfaces of bone matrix. So here, what we have is a slide, and I'm going to draw kind of a line at the boundary of the bone matrix itself. So here's the bone tissue. Okay. Now in this case here, you can see that it's very eosinophilic, and that's because what we're seeing here is the staining of the collagen. Okay, so this is decalcified matrix. Okay, so there are no calcium phosphate crystals here. Um, that is the only way that we can stain bone. Okay, um, in order to stain it, you need to make sure that uh, the stain is able to penetrate into this tissue. And that means that we need to remove the calcium phosphate crystals because stains are water soluble. Okay, and so in order to get the stain into the tissue, we have to remove first the calcium phosphate crystals. That's usually done by incubation in some acids. The acids tend to uh, remove calcium phosphate. Okay, and so what you're seeing here is really just the osteoid, and that's why it's staining very eosinophilic because what you're seeing here is basically type 1 collagen. Now, on the surface of this, you can see very basophilic cells, 
So that's this layer out here. And so you can see here these are very basophilic. Um, and so these are the osteoblasts. Okay, and so because they're on the surface of one of these bone trabeculae, um, together this layer would be referred to as the endosteum. We are not looking at the outside of the bone itself. So this is just part of the bone. Uh, and we're actually what we're seeing out here is some mesenchyme tissue. And there's a out of focus, here's a blood vessel. That'll become important very shortly. Okay, we'll talk about those soon. Um, just label that as a blood vessel. Okay. So this is the endosteum, which is composed of osteoblasts. And again, they are very highly um, active. So there's a lot of bone matrix production, a lot of protein production for export. So there's lots of rough ER in that cytoplasm, which is why that whole cell stains very basophilic. Okay. Now, uh, when they are active, they have a fairly large amount of cytoplasm, so they kind of look cuboidal or columnar in shape. Uh, when they are less active, they kind of look more squamous. I'm using those terms, those are terms that are usually described to, used to describe epithelium. I'm just using them here because you're already familiar with those terms and so you have an understanding of what they mean. But by no means are these epithelial cells. These are not epithelial cells, these are bone tissue cells, so they're connective tissue cells, technically. Okay? So that's osteoblasts. Uh, now, again, I just described for you some osteoblasts uh, lining the uh, part of a bone trabecula. What you're looking at here is kind of a zoomed out version of a, a whole bone. And so what you're seeing, and I'm going to outline the bone tissue again, very, very big eosinophilic material here. So what you're seeing here is bone matrix. I'm just kind of highlighting the outside of the bone matrix here. And what I just outlined is the outside of a bone, an actual bone. So this is periosteum on the outside of that. And then you have regions within this that are cavities, these open spaces inside the actual bone. And those cavities will be filled with things like bone marrow and some blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and so on. And a variety of cells. Just highlight a few more of these. So again, these cavities within the bone on the inside. We have blood vessels. Let me outline a few of those for you. So here's a blood vessel. And there's a blood vessel as well. Uh, there's a blood vessel here, I think, and there's a few openings here that look like they probably are going to be likely blood vessels. Again, why is this important? Well, it's important because um, all these cells that are within the bone matrix um, are embedded within a tissue that does not allow diffusion. And so you need to provide uh, nutrients in some other way for these cells, and we'll discuss those when we talk about compact bone. Okay, um, but just keep in mind that this matrix does not allow diffusion to happen, and so you need to have much closer association with blood vessels, and this is why we have all these little cavities everywhere. So again, I just highlight, highlighted a few of them, but here's another one, and here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. So you can see that they occur fairly frequently within this tissue, and so again, bone is very highly vascularized and so that's something to keep in mind and again that is there because there's the limitation of not being able to have uh, diffusion through this tissue so you have to have close blood vessels very close by okay so um, this layer of cells that are basophilic right at the surface here contains the osteoblasts, so you can see they're very basophilic, they're actively producing bone matrix, so osteoblasts are here. Okay, 
and then you have this layer that's on top of the osteoblasts here and that's where the fibroblasts are so these guys here these nuclei that you're seeing here would belong to fibroblasts and also some of the stem cells that would help to replace some of the osteoblasts as they become embedded within matrix okay so these guys here are fibroblasts okay so again just with um, just as we had with cartilage where we had a perichondrium which had two regions we had the fibrogenic layer and a chondrogenic layer same kind of organization happens here where we have fibroblasts and lots of uh, collagen on the outside and kind of uh, kind of a more of a loose arrangement uh, and then you have the osteoblasts closer to the surface of the bone matrix itself and that's the periosteum whereas within the bone itself we once again have a layer of basophilic cells lining the inside of these cavities uh, they're not always going to be very, very active or very, very obvious, so keep that in mind when you're looking at slides that they don't always look very uh, obvious or active because the, the bone is that, that you're looking at may not be very actively being produced. And so this region right here, these basophilic cells, these are, again, osteoblasts, but in this case they make up the endosteum because it's on the inside of the bone itself. Okay. Now, around them, within the matrix itself, are the osteocytes. And so the osteocytes are the more mature cells. They're much less active, um, and they're not mitotic in this case. Osteocytes, unlike chondrocytes, chondrocytes can divide and make isogenic groups. Osteocytes can't do that. Uh, the bone matrix is far too tough and far too rigid for any kind of um, interstitial growth. And so once an osteocyte is embedded within a matrix, it's basically stuck there. It's not going anywhere. Now, they basically stay within their lacunae. So again, that term lacuna shows up again here as well. Again, think of it as a small cave within which a cell will live. Um, now, these osteocytes that you're seeing here, this is a picture from compact bones. So there's an osteocyte here. There's an osteocyte here. There's another one here. There's another one here. Another one. Another one. And another one. And so these osteocytes are going to have to be connected to one another. That's what you're seeing here, these little lines that you're seeing here. They kind of look like little cracks in the slide or something, but they're actually there physically um, to help the cells connect to one another. So all these cells are interconnected, and they're going to be connected to all of their neighbors. And they're going to be connected to the central region here. This is one of those cavities I highlighted for you earlier. What you would have on the inside here would be osteoblasts, and there would be a blood vessel on the inside of this. And so what's going to happen is that nutrients and oxygen will flow from the blood vessel, will diffuse across the tissue to the osteoblasts, and then the osteoblasts will send them along through these cytoplasmic processes, these connections that you're seeing here, to the other cells. And so they will kind of share the stuff that's coming through from the blood vessel okay so uh, these what you're what you're seeing here are called canaliculi let me just change color here so canaliculi are these lines that you're seeing within this tissue okay and so those are basically the little tunnels within which you have cytoplasmic processes which interconnect all these cells with one another so again because there is no diffusion through the matrix, the cells have to be connected to one another so that they can have nutrients flow through uh, from cell to cell through the cytoplasm in between all of them. Okay, so they're kind of sharing all these things. So again, that's the consequence of not having uh, a hydrated, a hydrated matrix around them. Okay. The last cell type is the osteoclast. The osteoclast is actually not coming from uh, mesenchyme lineage, but in fact it's coming from the bone marrow itself. Uh, it's being derived from monocytes. Monocytes are members of your immune system, okay? so these are white blood cells, uh, but sometimes they will fuse together, so multiple cells to form a multinucleated cell 
Okay, and that's what you're seeing in this image here. So there is right here um, an osteoclast at the surface of some bone matrix. Okay, so we have an osteocyte. So there's an osteocyte right here. Um, there's multiple osteocytes visible within this photograph. I'm just showing you one that's embedded within the matrix. Uh, and so an osteoclast, you can see here, has, let me just maybe use blue to highlight the nuclei for you. So here's a nucleus here. Here's another nucleus. There's another nucleus. There's another nucleus here. Another one. Another one. It's probably another one over here. It's a little out of focus. Okay, so you have multiple nuclei here. Okay. Um, so it's a multinucleated cell um, that is used to break down and to dissolve and break down the uh, the connected the bone matrix. Okay, so it will dissolve, use acid to dissolve the calcium phosphate, and then use enzymes to break down the the type one collagen and all the other proteins within the matrix. So it can reabsorb the matrix itself. Okay. And so it's used for remodeling because the cell will break it down and you will have right next to them, you will have quite often osteoblasts, which can be used to build that matrix right back up, okay, in a slightly different way. So we have some osteoblasts here. So again, that's the endosteum, okay. So we have a few osteoblasts here in this particular image, side by side. So here's an osteoblast. Oops, maybe I should label that a little closer too. So you can see the label. I'm just going to label it OB osteoblast. Okay. Um, this red one here is an osteocyte. OC. And the one that's the large multinucleated cell is an osteoclast. Okay, now uh, hopefully you can see the difference between the cytoplasm of the osteoclast and osteoblast. The osteoblasts are very basophilic, whereas the cytoplasm of the osteoclast is very eosinophilic, and that's because you have a lot of mitochondria. Okay, and so the presence of mitochondria, lots and lots of mitochondria, because there's a lot of activity done by the cell. Um, because of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, you don't see them, but you do see the staining characteristic, um, giving them a much more eosinophilic appearance. Okay. Um, now, as these cells kind of chew away part of the matrix, um, they kind of cut out a small space for themselves, and that's called a Hauschip's lacuna. Um, so that lacuna would be kind of this region right here. Okay. All right. Let's move on to um, talking about the tissues. Okay. So the types of bone. And so here we just keep it simple. There's just compact and spongy bone. Uh, there's kind of a, a difference between mature compact bone and uh, less mature compact bone. But we're just going to stick to the two main types. Okay. So. Uh, the rest of these terms you will come across, or you have already come across, so we'll go through them as we go through this, these slides. So spongy bone is a much more lightweight tissue. Um, if your bones were made only of compact bone, you wouldn't be able to move. You'd be way too heavy. So spongy bone allows your bones to be light enough to move, okay? And it's basically a very wide open mesh. And that's what, again, is shown in this image down here. In three dimensions, you have these bone trabeculae that are kind of interconnected and they are um, kind of like a sponge, basically the same sort of organization. This is why the name is there, a spongy bone. Basically it kind of looks like you've got these interconnected network of solid materials and then you have lots and lots of empty spaces in between and those empty spaces are filled with bone marrow. So that's what you're seeing here is bone marrow. Okay. And these eosinophilic materials around that, right here. Kind of looking very irregular in shape. These are the bone trabeculae that I just highlighted. So this right here is a trabecula. Of bone. 
Again, trabecula is not specific to bone. You will see that term again showing up. So this is a bone trabecula. It just basically means that's just a solid part of the bone. Okay, so that's what I highlighted here in red. Okay, so these are the bone trabeculae. Okay, again, so it's basically a mesh, um, and so there's lots and lots of space in between them. And again, the lining where you would have any osteoblasts that are found within this region here. This is, again, spongy bone is only on the inside of the bone, so any kind of osteoblast that you would find around spongy bone would be an endosteum. Okay. Now, compact bone is organized a little bit differently. Um, you still have cavities that would be filled with um, sometimes uh, um, mesenchyme tissue or something similar to it, but there's going to be always blood vessels within this. Okay, so there's always going to be a blood vessel there, and you'll notice that there's a lot of these. And again, that's because there's a limit to how many uh, osteocytes you can feed from a single blood vessel. Okay, and so you have these organization into these um, structures, these kind of cylindrical structures, these round structures that you see here. This would be referred to as an osteon, or, depending on where in the world they're coming from, a Habersian system. Okay, so uh, I, I think the Brits call it an osteon, and the Americans tend to call it a Habersian system. Either way, it's the same thing. Okay. Um, now, what you have is a bunch of these osteocytes embedded within matrix, kind of organized in these concentric circles around the outside of the central canal. Okay, And so what you have is this uh, referred to as a lama a lamellae. Okay? And so by lamella, I mean basically this kind of layer. Let me make sure that a smaller line kind of layer of matrix around the outside of this and that would be a concentric lamella okay so let me just maybe use a different color to highlight another one so here would be a different concentric lamella around the outside of this okay and so this layering pattern is um, kind of what sets up these osteons okay let me just go back to the marker. And so again, you have um, these osteons, basically. Okay. And so again, what we're looking at it is basically bone and cross section. So you'd have these very long um, cylinders like this going up and down down the length of your bones. Okay. That's really meant to be able to um, withstand a lot of compressive, um, a lot of compression. Okay. Now let's take a closer look at this organization a little bit more. Okay, so the Herbergen system. Okay, so um, imagine that you've just um, started off with a fairly large open space within the bone matrix. Okay, so you have this open space that was cut away by osteoclasts, and then you're going to have some osteoblasts that will end up on the surface of this, and they're going to start laying down some matrix. Now, what's going to happen here is that at some point these cells are going to um, lay down matrix between themselves and above themselves, and so you end up with uh, a layer of matrix that's going to cover them, and so they can become embedded within this matrix, and so we now know them, or we now can refer to them as osteocytes. Now when you have this new layer of matrix on the surface of that obviously we're going to have more osteoblasts and these osteoblasts are going to again lay down some matrix material underneath themselves around themselves and also above themselves and so you end up with another of these layers of osteoid being produced which will eventually get filled in okay and so what we have here are these concentric lamellae. Okay, so concentric lamellae are these layers of collagen that are produced. 
And again, at the end, you're going to have this central canal that is again lined by osteoblasts and there's a blood vessel inside. Okay, so now what we have is a haversion system. Okay. Now, what is going to happen over time is that bone remodeling will happen. Okay, and so with bone remodeling, what happens is that again osteoclasts will come along and they will chew away a part of this. They will break down part of this matrix. forming a new boundary, so let me just kind of highlight a new outer region for this. And again, osteoblasts will come along. And these osteoblasts will then start to produce more matrix, and so they will lay down a fresh layer of osteoid, and so we're going to have this again new lamella formed and then we're going to have again more osteoblasts coming along and they will then start to produce more matrix above themselves and to produce a new layer of material so again we have another concentric lamella formed forming a whole new haversion system or a new osteon and again osteoblasts are on the inside of this central canal okay so now what we have is this is no longer a concentric lamella the concentric lamella are over here and though these ones over here the ones from the old haversion system no longer have a central canal that they're connected to and so these are now called interstitial lamellae so they kind of lamellae that don't belong to uh, a specific conversion system anymore. Okay. So we have conversion canals, which are in the center of the conversion system, and then periodically blood vessels in bone will branch off, as blood vessels do. And so when they do that, they will have connecting channels that will connect one conversion canal to another. these connections would be referred to as Volkmann's canals. Okay, so let's take a quick look at an example of this before we finish. So here's an example of some of these conversion canals. So what we're seeing, oops, maybe I should use a different color. Okay, so here's a central canal or conversion canal. Here's a conversion canal over here. Here's another one. It looks a little elongated. That's probably more of a, the beginnings of a Volkmann's canal here. And again, what we have are osteocytes associated with this conversion canal here. So we have all these osteocytes kind of sending out their cytoplasm process to the inside. And these osteocytes here belonging to this one. And then you have this group of osteocytes here, and some of this tissue here that doesn't really seem to belong to anything. Okay, so these would be the interstitial lamellae. Okay, all right, so I hope this has been helpful. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.